Robbie and Professor David. Um, okay. So my paper today is on the Clerk's Tale. It's one of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. And it's based on the last story of Boccaccio to Cameron, and it's retelling by Petrarch. In the tale, Walter, the Marquis and Royal Sovereign of Sorrento, Italy, is a bachelor. And so is begged by his townspeople to take a wife in order to secure his rule with a male heir. Walter goes into town and chooses Griselda, a peasant, to marry. As a condition of his proposal, Walter requires Griselda never to disobey his every will and whim, neither by word nor frown and countenance. Griselda accepts, an, accepts his offer, and after they are married, Walter feels the urge to test Griselda's virtue and fidelity, and does so in an extreme manner. First, Griselda is stripped in public and forced to change into royal attire before entering the palace. Then later, on the pretext that Griselda's ignoble birth as a peasant, he legitimizes her children as heirs to his rule. Walter forces her to give up both her daughter and son, ostensibly to death. Then he divorces her, citing again her low birth as justification to find a more noble wife. But the whole time, Walter's intention is not to actually carry out these tests. So when he calls Griselda back to the palace to prepare it for his wedding to his new wife, Griselda's replacement, Walter finally reveals that this was a final test of Griselda's love and virtue, and that she has passed them all. Griselda re reassumes her place as wife, her children are returned, and she swoons and faints in the joyous rapture of this revelation. Griselda's literary legacy has been, then, that of a paragon of the virtue of patience or constancy. One might point out, though, that in Griselda, suffering and obedience is styled as feminine virtue precisely epitomizes a patriarchal construction of femininity. Thus, recent feminist readings of the tale find within it an ethical impasse, viewing Griselda as an ethical monstrosity. What feminists would not protest against such outrageous demands of subservience? Because she submits to Walter unquestioningly, Griselda is for Catherine McKinley something of a hagiographic Barbie, idealized, perfect, virtuous, but incapable of manifesting subjectivity or agency for any type of authentic spiritual struggle, which would somehow make sense in the senseless suffering she withstands. But is it possible to read Griselda otherwise? If so, then on what terms? It certainly cannot be that of a historicizing and relativizing of medieval value systems. And if to our modern ethical temperament Griselda is intolerable, intolerable, then is there no way out, no line of flight from the patriarchal order of things? I claim there is. It requires an adjustment of interpretive lens and requires us to put on, so to speak, a pair of anagogical goggles. So let me just get the presentation up here. Gogical Griselda, and then we're going to talk about a little bit of uh, medieval hermeneutics here. Um, so in the medieval tradition of reading and interpretation, there are four levels of meaning, the literal, the moral, the allegorical, and the anagogical. There is the literal level, just what happens, purely indicative or denotative. And there is the moral level, which is the interpretation that tells one how to act. Then the allegorical level, which gives a text its theological or ideological meaning, tells one what to believe. Then the anagogical level, which is the mystical or hidden sense of the text that goes beyond any set of received beliefs or systems of thought. McKinley and others make clear how the moral and allegorical meanings of the tale are aesthetically and structurally dissatisfying. Even the tale itself resists such a reading. The clerk, the tale teller, comments at the end, of, at the tale's conclusion, that this story is said not to wives should follow Griselda in her humility, for it would be intolerable, literally importable is the word, it cannot be carried or unbearable. Um, and it would, it would be unbearable if they would. And he continues, I say that it's ill-befitting to test a wife when there is no need and put her in anguish and in dread. Despite the fact that Griselda and the clerk's tale is firmly situated within the genre of medieval hagiography or stories of saints' lives, the feminist reading of her saint's life refuses her saintliness any actual spiritual significance. The way out, then, may be to read Griselda not according to either the letter of her literal suffering or her allegorical read, patriarchal recuperation as inhuman, per purely virtuous symbol of patience, but rather, in short, anagogically. Encountering the anagogical dimension of the text demonstrates its mystical sense, but the paradox is that this level cannot be stated or pointed to as such, precisely because the anagogical meaning is non-representational. Instead of merely indicating a thing, miraculously, it gives the thing indicated. Language is usually representational. We have a word, and the word represents or refers to some thing which is not the word. When I say cup, this is decidedly not the cup with which I drink. I think there is a discernible difference between word and thing, and they never coincide. 
But anagogy is not representational, but presentational. Anagogy is when the word possibly touches the thing. So let's do an example. So an example of this is Dante's numerological description of Beatrice in the Vita Nuova. Therefore, if three by itself is the factor of nine, and the factor of miracles multiplied by itself is three, that is, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are three and one, this woman was accompanied by this number nine to make it understood that she was a nine. A miracle, in other words, whose root, the root of the miracle, is none other than the miraculous trinity. This is a little, a little trippy here, but... Here, Beatrice is not only a woman, but a woman who is a miracle, and thus a numeric entity whose square root is the trinity. That's Dantean anagogy. So we're going to move to a more contemporary example. The Greek root of anagogy means to raise up, to swell, as a wave swells and raises a ship during a storm. So while we listen to this clip to a more contemporary instance of anagogy, which some of you may recognize, keep in mind the dynamics of the singer's voice and how with repetition the voice creates this swelling, a sonic and hermeneutic saturation.
or to be dead, though me were loath to die. So the three critical words to examine here are wondering, quaking, and dreda. According to the Middle English Dictionary, wondering signifies amazement, astonishment, but also punishment, puzzlement. Quaking means to tremble or shudder because of strong emotion, especially with fear. And dreda indicates fear, terror, but also awe and reverence in the face of the divine. Quite literally then, Griselda hears in Walter's speech her proposal to her, um, his proposal to her, the, the speech of God, causing her to tremble in an experience of the mysterium tremendum. What makes the body tremble is that which exceeds our capacity for seeing and knowing. As Jacques Derrida writes, we tremble for the dissymmetry that exists between the divine regard that sees me and myself, who doesn't see what is looking at me, whose will we cannot know, but can surrender to. Hence the phrases wondering upon this word and quaking for Dreda reveal in the diction of the poetry itself not this literal awe at the presence of a sovereign, but hyper-literally the sense of awe at the figuration of the divine. In this way, anagogy raises literality to hyper-literality, which, like a halo, a halo, says Agamben, does not alter substantially or literally Griselda's words or actions, but rather their sense and their limits. The halo does not take place in things, but at their periphery in the space of ease between everything and itself. Anagogy, then, is the halo of language, the glow at the edges of meaning. While literally in acceptance of Walter's marriage proposal, anagogically, Griselda has assented to a betrothal with God, a common trope in the discourse of medieval mystics. This betrothal, as any engagement to marriage, is a promise of a later fruition. Mystical betrothal is then that which Derrida says promises the impossible, but is a promise where there is no salvation there in the promise. And I add, yet. Griselda promises to surrender her will, and God, acting through Walter, promises the salvation and the fruition of mystical marriage or union, but not yet. It has to be proven, i.e. through Walter's and God's test. Structural, structurally, then, the world union of Griselda and Walter foretells the remarriage that the joy, the remarriage, the joyous mystical reunion at the end, at the tale's end. The pecu peculiar romantic structure of the tale, the fact that there are two marriages, one here between Griselda and Walter, and one at the tale's conclusion, not only illustrates the duplicity of the literal and anagogical, but it also implies an arc of spiritual development and movement that traces the movement from the literal to the mystical. Thus, if we are to follow Griselda on her spiritual journey, we must, as anyone on a spiritual journey must, rely on a guide. Ours will be the great mis medieval mystic heretic who was burned at the stake in Paris in 1310, Marguerite Poirette, cartographer of this mystical map. In her book, whose writing brought death upon her, the mirror of simple souls who are annihilated and remain only in will and desire of love. The title is amazing. Um, Poirette describes mystical union as the fruition of humility and death to the world. In other words, the surrendering of all earthly attachments, including one's own will and sense of self, produces mystical experience of unity, oneness, and love. For Perrette, this takes place over three main transitions, three deaths which bear three lives. Thus, there are three, well, let's talk about this real quick. The death of sin is like, you know, the, the death of like a non-spiritual subjectivity, like a subjectivity that just has nothing to do with the spiritual. Once that dies, you enter the life of grace, which is on the spiritual path. The death of human nature is the death of like external works. Like, you know, if you're on a spiritual path, like you really want to be virtuous, but the, that, the death of human nature then is to not care about that anymore not to care about externality whatsoever. It's a pure into interiority, which is the life of spirit. Then the death of spirit is to actually not have any interior will whatsoever. It's the abnegation of all will. And you want of nothing. You literally have no more desire because you lack nothing. That is the life of glory, and that is like, that's our destination. So how do we get there? Thus, there are three external thresholds or fulcrums of Griselda's passing back and forth across physical space and social class, which anagogically indicate her spiritual passing through the lives and deaths of Perrette outlines. The anagogical sense of Griselda's passing through these thresholds are marked by three disrobings and reclothings, which in general indicate an interior stripping of the self from the world and its reclothing in the divine. So, in short, Griselda's literal external movement through space and place points to her anagogical movement from self to non-self from human soul in bondage to the liberated, annihilated soul. So this is our, this is our map for today. So 
So you'll see that there's three movements. Griselda moves from her father's house to the palace after her marriage. Then she's divorced. She moves from the palace to her, back to her father's house. But then Walter calls her back to the palace from her father's house, and she ends there. So, okay. In this way, Griselda's ascent to the marriage proposal is the first step on this path and is her first spiritual death. So we're at, we're at one. Exiting her father's house, Walter presents Griselda to the public, requiring her to strip naked in front of them, right there, so that no thing of her old gear should, bri should bring into his house, he bade, that women should despoil her. The act of disrobing, enacted by the word despoiling, meaning to undress, but also to ravage and ransack, involves a metaphorical stripping of worldly identity. When Griselda's public stripping literally indicates her, trans her transition between social classes, Anagogically, it indicates what Perret calls the death of sin into the life of grace. The words old gear, though literally referring to Griselda's clothing, hyperliterally signifies Griselda's worldly attachment. As the NAD defines it, old gear, gear are her things, materials, stuff, stuff of the world, which must be abandoned upon entering Walter, Walter's, i.e. God's house. That the women who disrobe and reclothe Griselda were not right glad to handle her clothes wherein she was clad literally indicates that Griselda is a working peasant who would therefore have dirty clothes. But hyperliterally, the sense is that the human form, as the clothing of the soul, is in need of purification. The death of sin is the death of non-spiritual subjectivity, and as such, after this death, one is born into a new life. Hence, Griselda, reclothed outwardly, is reborn inwardly. Nonetheless, this may bright of hue, fro foot to head, they clothed on all new. Indeed, her new clothes signify a renewal and a passage from one class to another, from peasantry to royalty, but also that of an initiation of the human into walking the path of the divine. In fact, the spiritual transformation is total. Her father thought she was, a, she was another creature. She was increased in such excellence that each who looked upon her face loved her. Thus, Griselda does indeed live the life of grace, which Perret describes as willingly following the double law of charity, of loving God and one's neighbor, especially in external works. In fact, she even runs the estate when Walter is absent, resolving conflicts between noblemen with such wise and well-considered words had she in judgments of such great justice that she was sent from heaven, as men suppose, to save people to save and everyone to amend. Yet, Griselda does not does indeed die the death of nature also, i.e. human nature, as Perret writes. So now we're on stage two. As Perret writes, those who experience the death of nature are those who never forget love's humiliations and sufferings, which they are constantly holding up to themselves as a mirror and example. When Walter tells Griselda he's going to take her daughter away in an echo of Abraham and Isaac, Griselda says, my child and I with heartfelt obedience are entirely yours, and you may save or kill your own thing, do as you will. Nor do I desire to have anything, nor dread to lose, save only you. This will is in my heart and ever shall be. No length of time or death can obliterate this, nor change, of, nor change my heart to another place. So the ad addressee is literally Walter, but you can tell the diction is like really to a divine addressee. By ascending to Walter's, i.e. God's will, Griselda has forsaken all her outer desires and only, desi and only desire to fulfill God's will alone turning to the inner life of the spirit. Her patience and ascent seems to know no limits as she disentangles even from one of the strongest earthly bonds, that between mother and child. Thus, thus Griselda transgresses the ethical order and in violating the bond between mother and child, she violates, according to Kierkegaard, the highest expression of the ethical, that what binds us to our own and to our fellows. In a sense, then, for Abraham and Griselda, as Kierkegaard declares, the ethical is a temptation, an obstacle to die into the world. One must truly give up everything in order to realize mystical union in nothingness. As Perret puts it, because in Griselda the spirit of possessiveness is dead, as she no longer possesses herself or her children, she obeys a higher law. The law of Christ and his gifts which are above the law are enshrined in her heart. Perret continues, the soul lets the dead bury their dead, and so she is concerned with none of the things. And not only is Griselda's identity as a mother taken away from her, so is her identity as a wife. Walter divorces her, and Griselda is sent from the palace and is again stripped of her clothing. But Griselda also accept this, accepts this with utmost patience and humility. This time, Griselda is not stripped of sin, but of anything tying her to the earthly. Be strong of heart and void anon her place, 
author says, performatively, performatively enacting his divorce, Griselda. But her place, with this command to avoid the place of and as his wife, is anagogically, and so also literally, a demand for Griselda to void herself. The place Griselda voids, the place she attempts to empty herself and vacates, is not the place of another, because Walter's new wife actually doesn't exist. So it is, in fact, Griselda's place all along. Remember, this is all just a test, a trial of Griselda's patience. So the place Griselda avoids is precisely her place in the world. This is the pure taking place of Griselda's nothingness, her self abnegation the cusp of her death of the spirit. Now, stripped of all, of all her royal clothing, except a cloth covering her womb, that is to say, bereft of all worldly ties, Griselda thus leaves the palace and returns to her father's house. But only a short time later, Walter calls on Griselda to come back to the palace to prepare I clean the estate for the ceremony of his wedding with his new wife. And it's in this transition back to the palace where we see Griselda's final transition, the experience of the wife of Gloria living as Perrette writes, always outside of herself. Walter requests Griselda to acknowledge the beauty of his, quote, new wife. And when Griselda does, adding a remark that Walter should treat her more tenderly, Walter declares this is enough and reveals the trials for what they are. At this, Griselda is overwhelmed and fared as, as if she had suddenly awakened out of a sleep until out of her bewilderment, she suddenly awoke. She declares, since I stand in your love and in your grace, death does not matter, nor when my spirit may pass away. That's literally word for word what Perret is saying. Thus is the performative utterance of her death of the spirit, which proceeds directly to her mystical union, her life of glory. After her children are reunited with her, Griselda, all suddenly she swept a dome to ground, holding her children so tightly they could only with great difficulty tear themselves away. When she arises out of her trance, she is again stripped of her rude array, or attire, and is dressed in a cloth of gold and a crown of many a rich stone was set upon her head. They into the hala her brata, and there she was honored as her hafta, as she deserved. Griselda's final and regal standing in love and grace shows what Agamben defines as salvation, the coming to itself of the place. Or what Perret writes, that goodness draws her out of herself and into itself where she is united in the divine goodness itself. Thus, Griselda is crowned in divinity. She is now the loving grace in which she stands. Yet, as the clerk says, though this tale has a blissful end, Griselda demands us to ask the question, why? What was, what was the point of all this suffering? In a postscript to the tale, which he signs with his own name, Chaucer goes so far as to say, Griselda is dead and also her patience. Why the author authorial hedging by the clerk and even outright rejection by Chaucer? Perhaps because Griselda's patience is precisely without a why. That is to say, her endurance of why the suffering is radical and is thus dangerously misreadable. In this way, Griselda reveals what Agamben calls the meaning of ethics, becoming clear only when one understands that the good is not and cannot be a good thing or possibility beside or above every bad thing or possibility. Thus, the good does not counter evil with a good, but instead the good itself goes beyond good and evil. To pursue this good without good is to practice patience, which is, for Hadowich, another great medieval woman mystic, is to be without any sorrow in all sorrow. This is the anagogical sense of Griselda's patience, and without this delicate attunement, her example does indeed become as truly dangerous as it is radical. So Griselda's ascent to Walter and God is not a blind following nor oppressed coercion, but a radical acceptance a choice to not run from the literality of trauma, but to acknowledge trauma's taking place and to live through it, to have the courage and patience to go on living. To use the words of Meister Eckhart, Griselda stands in the midst of things, but not in things. She stands not in external suffering, not even in a transcendent God, but wholly internally, standing in the love and grace of the mystical nothingness of herself as one and with God as herself, this standing in love and nothing else is, as Francois Laruelle writes, a being rooted in oneself, a being held within one's own imminence, which is Griselda's transcendence. Griselda then, in the face of brutal patriarchal suffering, is indeed a saintly exemplar of how to withstand it, showing us that the way out, then, is the way in. Thank you.